What perceptions do you have of Jesus? Where do they come from? Do they come from your imagination? Do our perceptions come from the media that we take in? Or are your perceptions formed by scripture, the Bible, the word written that reveals the word living? Unfortunately, this may be the least used source. The resurrection of Christ kind of feels like a, a climax to the, to the story. That empty tomb seems... It kind of feels like, the well, that's the end. That's the end of the story. And in a way, it is very much a climax to the story, the story of, of Jesus. But that's not where uh, Luke ends his gospel. Thankfully, that's not where Luke ends his gospel. Because as we're going to see this morning, there were problems. There were issues that needed correction. There were perceptions that needed to be changed. Now, I want, I want to take a, just a moment to talk about how we perceive the world around us, how, how that perception of reality can be shaped by how we imagine the world is or how we imagine the world should be. To do this, I need some assistance uh, to illustrate it. The, the last time I spoke, I made reference to something my younger daughter said. So now this morning, I'm going to ask to be a fair parent. I'm going to ask my older daughter to come up here just to help me illustrate this. Now, when you picture Jesus in your mind, do you picture Jesus taller than you? I do. Honestly, I've always pictured Jesus taller than myself. Now, we know from uh, anthropology and osteology research that the average height of a first century Palestinian Jew was five foot five inches. That's actually one of the reasons the people were so excited about Saul being king. Saul was taller than everyone else. Abriella here is five foot, five inches tall. Sc scripture states that Jesus, there was nothing stately about him. He was average. This is average. For now. This is not her average. This is probably the height of Jesus. Now, that's not how we always picture Jesus, especially in artwork and media. Jesus is usually depicted as very tall. Uh, I haven't viewed much of the TV series The Chosen, but I've seen it enough to recognize that the, the actor that portrays Jesus in The Chosen is, if not the tallest, he's one of the tallest people in that cast. But this is how it affects, this is an example of how our perceptions are affected by how we imagine things. The greatness of Jesus, we recognize his greatness, and his greatness forms our perception of even his physical stature. Okay, you, you can go back. Thank you very much. What other things? inform our perception of Jesus. We're going to look at a story that Luke records in his gospel that addresses this exact thing. If you would please turn in your Bibles to the gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 24. And I, I forgot to write down the page number in, in your paper pew Bibles. I guess it's six. 10 maybe? I don't know, it's just a guess. But we're going to read uh, verses 13 through 35 of chapter 24. And if you would please stand for the reading of God's word. Verses 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. 
And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Verse 28, so they drew near the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them, and with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. When they told what had happened on the road, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Please pray with me. Lord God, we recognize your greatness. We recognize your holiness. We also recognize that without your intervention, we are blind people. Our sin clouds our eyes, it clouds our minds, but in your mercy and grace, you reach out to us while we grope about we pray that the Holy Spirit might open our eyes to truth, to reality, the truth laid out before us in your word. Open our minds to that word. May your teaching be presented and understood so that we can know you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Luke uses this section, the, the story, the scripture we just read, to, to bridge between the section from last week, verses 1 through 12, where we find the disciples discovering the empty tomb, but not believing in Jesus' resurrection. And verses 36 through 49, a section where we will see the disciples' unbelief being turned to belief. The bridge portion, verses 13 through 35, is a story that only Luke records. And it's a fascinating story of Jesus beginning to turn the unbelief of his followers to belief by correcting their perceptions. Now, if we go to verse 13, we read the phrase, that very day, the events that follow are on the same day as the events in the preceding 12 verses. It is Sunday, the first day of the week, the day of Jesus' resurrection. It is obvious that some time has passed, but it's still the same day. We find two people, traveling companions, going down the road. Now, these two people are relatively nameless, although uh, one, we find out one of them is named Cleopas. 
But still, this is not a, a significant person outside of this story. They're, they're just relatively unknown. There's a fair amount of speculations by scholars that uh, this, this may have been a husband and wife but truth is, we, we just don't know. Luke doesn't specify. What we can deduce is that these two traveling companions were disciples of Jesus. They, of course, are not part of the 12, that, that inner circle, but were part of a wider group of followers. Because this section is connected to the previous, when Luke uses the phrase, two of them, the them is part of the subject of the previous being the disciples. So we know that more than just the 11 disciples and the group of women were staying in or near the city after the crucifixion. This is also indicated in Acts with the uh, story of Pentecost where there was a large group of disciples in Jerusalem awaiting the giving of the Holy Spirit. And before that, Jesus will give his disciples a command to stay in the city while they wait. Jesus seemed to desire that his followers and disciples remain together as a group, at least at certain times up to the time of Pentecost. Now, these two disciples are traveling to a village called Emmaus. Emmaus is uh, lost to time. We don't know exactly where it's at, but this, the text says it's about seven miles from Jerusalem, probably north, north uh, west of Jerusalem. Now, this is where a modern translation of the, the Bible is nice, because I understand seven miles. If you have an older translation, it's going to say something like three score furlong, and I have no idea what that is, but apparently it's something like seven miles. So these disciples were looking at roughly a two-hour walk, we don't know exactly why these two disciples left Jerusalem. Emmaus may have been home for them. Their home could have been further away, and maybe Emmaus was just the, the first stop on their travel. The interesting thing is that you could say these two left a funeral early. Now, if you recall, a, a, a Jewish period of mourning is one week. And these two aren't apparently sticking around for that whole week after Jesus died. They're, they're heading home. And this may give us some insight into what they were thinking and feeling at the moment. What gives us more insight is that verse 15 says, they were talking and discussing with each other. They were energetically debating all the things that had occurred in the last few days, maybe, maybe the last week, maybe more. They were talking about all the things surrounding Jesus. They had a couple hours to kill. So they were discussing back and forth the events, trying to make some sense out of it. And this would be a very normal thing to do. Don't we often, you know, if we lack understanding on a thing, seek, seek out somebody to you know, have a conversation with, bounce ideas off of, try to, together, try to come up with an explanation. Or getting a different perspective from someone can help make something understandable. Do we do the same thing with spiritual matters or matters of Scripture, the person of Jesus? Do we spend time with a brother or sister in Christ just discussing the Word? The British theologian, and Bishop J.C. Ryle says this, conference on spiritual subjects is a most important means of grace. As iron sharpeneth iron, so does exchange of thoughts with brethren sharpen a believer's soul. It brings down a special blessing on all who make a practice of it. He points out the words of Malachi 3, verses 16 and 17, then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. 
So while these two disciples are engrossed in this conversation between themselves as they're traveling to Emmaus, Jesus shows up, starts walking next to them. We don't know exactly what this looked like. He just shows up, and the two disciples didn't notice. They weren't paying attention. They were, they were focused on their conversation. Luke states that this is Jesus who has joined them. But what's interesting is the two disciples don't recognize him. Why wouldn't these two, who presumably spent much time following Jesus, why would, why would they not recognize him? There are maybe a, a few possible explanations. His appearance was different. Scripture states <clears throat> that his beating was so severe that his appearance changed. Also, he was now in his resurrected body. Maybe it was uh, a little more perfect than the previous version. Another thought is they didn't recognize him because they never expected to see him, especially not there. This is just speculation, though. If we take a closer examination of verse 16, we read, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. I think we have to say that this was a supernatural activity of restraining their eyes. Why would Jesus do this? There are stories of kings putting on a disguise, dressing like a peasant, and going out among the people to find out what the people really think of the king. Jesus most likely desired to draw out the real emotions and thoughts of these two. If they would have recognized Jesus right away, the conversation probably would have taken a very different path. And what he wanted to teach them may not have registered. When Jesus joins them in verse 17, he asks the world's oldest question. Hey, what are you guys talking about? Jesus interjects himself into the conversation by asking, what are all these words being bandied about between you? It, which is a little more literal translation. What has got you so worked up? The two disciples are wearing their emotions on their sleeves by their reaction. When Jesus asks this, they're shocked by the stranger's ignorance, and it stops them in their tracks, and they just stand there looking sad. They're downcast, distraught, disappointed, depressed. Something was not right. The stranger wanted to know what it was. In verse 18, we read, Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? They're saying, they're asking, really? Really, you don't know? You don't know what has happened? Have you been living under a rock? Their indignation was very evident. They thought this stranger was quite the bumpkin to be so ignorant. In verse 19, Jesus doubles down by asking them, what things? He's prodding the two disciples, attempting to get them to bear all their thoughts and feelings. Why would he go about it this way? Well, if you think a good teacher will often establish what the mindset of the student is before beginning the lesson. And Jesus is about to give them a lesson. What was the mindset of the disciples? What had them so worked up? In the latter part of verse 19, we read, And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. They explained to the stranger who Jesus was, that he in their eyes was a prophet, that he was mighty, he performed miracles, he was mighty in, in word. He could speak and preach with authority and rally followers, criticize enemies, and that he was obviously favored by God and blessed greatly by God to be able to do this. The shortcoming in their understanding was that even though these characteristics are technically true, they are wholly inadequate to fully describe Jesus. He's much more than that. In their minds, 
where things went wrong, they describe in verse 20, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and, cru and crucified him. Things went wrong because the chief priests and rulers were the very ones who should be able to recognize a prophet or someone blessed greatly by God. But they didn't. Instead, they turned Jesus over to the Romans for trial and execution. Again, the shortcoming in their understanding was that these disciples were still trusting in their current religion. They believed that the religious leaders were not really the enemies of Jesus' message. They believed that Jesus' message would convince them also. It probably dumbfounded them that instead of coming around and accepting Jesus because he was such an impressive prophet, the religious leaders had him killed. Now we come to the heart of the reason why these two disciples are so upset in verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. They had hoped that Jesus was a redeemer of Israel. We read this today and say, well, yeah, he is. We, we understand that. But we think in terms of a spiritual redeemer. These people were not thinking that they even needed a spiritual redeemer. What they needed was a political redeemer, someone to liberate them from Roman rule. They were thinking back to Israel in Egypt in Exodus 6, 6 through 7. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from sla slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. In their minds, these two disciples were connecting Jesus with Moses, Rome with Egypt, and a renewed kingdom with the freedom from slavery. They really were expecting a political redeemer, an earthly king, a warrior to defeat the Roman oppressors. They built all this up in their minds. To add to their confusion, you have the events of the morning, which relate the stranger, which, which they related to the stranger, recorded in verses 22 through 24, that, uh, where we find the, the women in our company. Again, this would indicate that these two disciples were present and part of the larger group of disciples and therefore would have heard the report from the women of the tomb being empty. Just like the 11 disciples, these two apparently had disregarded the report of the women. The women said that angels told them that Jesus was alive, but some others went to the tomb and found it empty. No one found Jesus alive. Now, Jesus had been listening to all this and finally responds in verse 25. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus calls them fools. I can imagine that this response caught the two disciples off guard. I mean, who are you to call us fools? You didn't even know what was going on in Jerusalem. The word here that gets translated to foolish is aneotos, and it means senseless or without understanding. Jesus describes them as just not getting it. You're not getting the point. And your hearts are slow to believe. You have all the information. All the prophets have spoken. It should be obvious. You are just refusing to believe. He then asked them a rhetorical question in verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer? The prophets said it would happen. It was necessary for Jesus to suffer, to fulfill Scripture, and enter into his glory. The prophets said that it would, it would happen too, but after the suffering, it was necessary for Jesus to suffer to be glorified. Jesus then gives them a lesson from the Old Testament. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
He interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, all the prophecies concerning himself, the descriptions, the events, <clears throat> and the purposes he gave to these two disciples, the interpretation. He started with Moses, which means he probably started at the beginning, the very beginning. Why wouldn't you start there? Then Moses wrote the first five books, so that would be true. In verses 28 and 29, after Jesus' Bible lesson, we see the group arriving at their destination, the village of Emmaus. Jesus seemed to indicate that he was going to leave the two and continue on. Did he have somewhere to be? Or was he testing the disciples' desire? The two disciples request that he stay with them. Their argument is that the evening, that it is evening and the day is, is spent. Now, in this time, Jewish reckoning was any time the sun was past high noon, it was going down. That was evening. So evening was a large portion of the day. But it, it's probably something like mid-afternoon now when they arrive in the village. A 3 p.m. meal was quite common. Jesus grants their request and stays with them at the house of one of the disciples, or, or maybe it's both of their, maybe they both own it. Verse 30 states that when they sat down to have a meal, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this, this broke protocol. The, the homeowner, the host, was the one who usually served. But Jesus takes the role of the host. I think it's important to point out that this is not a communion meal, such as a Passover meal, that these two disciples would have recognized. They, they weren't at the Last Supper with Jesus. They would not have recognized that. And there's no mention of wine here with this meal, which Jesus stated he would not drink again until in glory. Now, these two disciples may have been present when Jesus fed maybe the 5,000, and they may have recognized similarities to that. At the moment Jesus broke the bread and gave it to them, we read what happens in verses 31 and 32. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures? First off, they fully recognized Jesus. Their eyes were opened. Now, how did this happen? Did they finally recognize him? Was it something he said or did that was familiar? Was it better lighting? Or was it just like before, when their eyes were kept from recognizing this is something supernatural? As soon as they do recognize him, however, he vanishes from their sight. We ask, why would that be? It seems like it would be right at this point that the two disciples could really start enjoying Jesus' company. Instead, he up and disappears. Once the disciples recognized him, they were going to go wherever he went. They were going to stick with him. But really, he had accomplished his task of setting their mindset right. And I think he wanted them to go back to Jerusalem to the other disciples. And now we see them sitting by themselves. They ask each other, did not our hearts burn while he spoke? As he opened the scripture, the two disciples experienced, when, when Jesus was describing himself in the scripture, these two disciples, disciples were experiencing one aha moment after another. Their emotion was so great that it caused a physiological response. And we're familiar with that, right? Heartbreak really causes chest pains. Nervousness really causes the stomach to churn. Joyous excitement really causes the heart to race and burn. And we've probably all experienced that. What did the disciples do now? In verses 33 through 35, it says that they immediately, that very hour, returned to Jerusalem. They made the two-hour walk back, probably at a quicker pace this time, it's still the same day, so they would have made it back to Jerusalem before sundown. They find the 11, it states. But again, this group is most likely more than just the 11 disciples, and, they, and they're gathered together. Now, the passive voice, perfect tense usage of the verb 
here for gathered together suggests that this group of believers was now permanently joined together. Perhaps that is why Jesus appeared to these disciples on the road that had walked away from Jerusalem in disappointment to turn them back, that they would be joined to this beginning core of believers. They found the group talking about Jesus appearing to Simon. Now, we, we don't know exactly what this, which parents this was, the one to Simon, but it indicates that they were starting to believe. The two disciples tell their story. They relate all that happened to them about meeting this stranger on the road, how he interpreted scripture about the Messiah, how their hearts burned, the breaking of bread and the revelation of Jesus to them. At this, all this motivated them to pro proclaim Jesus like it should us. What can we say about these two disciples and their perception of the Messiah? Their emotional state when they began their journey was one of massive disappointment. This was caused because their perception of the Messiah was that he would be a political reformer, a warrior liberator, a conqueror king. Their minds were in the here and now. They desired an earthly kingdom. Now, we can't be too hard on these disciples individually. They're, they were no different than the other disciples. In Mark 10, 35 through 38, we read, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him, that being Jesus, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Now, James and John were thinking also of Jesus building an earthly kingdom. And they were asking for positions of power and influence in his kingdom. This is the same mindset as Judas. Judas didn't betray Jesus because he hated Jesus. He realized that Jesus was not going to be the type of Messiah that he wanted. So he thought that maybe, well, maybe I could at least profit from it, was maybe what he was thinking. Or maybe he thought, once Jesus is backed into a corner, he'll unleash his true power and become the conquering political Messiah that he wanted. The disciples had no understanding, or very little understanding, of Jesus speaking of a spiritual kingdom. But he said it to Pilate. When Pilate asked him if he was a king, Jesus responded, My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is from another place. What's disappointing for us is that Jesus gives probably the greatest Bible lesson in all of history that completely changed the disciples' perceptions of Jesus, and we don't know what he said, because Luke didn't record it. But actually, we do have it. We can know at least the basics of what Jesus taught by reading the Old Testament and typo with typology and Christology in mind. And it took Jesus two hours to do it. I can't guarantee that I can do it in two hours. Uh, might take a little longer, but I'll try. So here we go. Starting with Moses. Moses wrote the promised seed, the promised seed, Genesis 3.15. God speaking to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Obviously, the serpent in the garden was a divine being. The seed of the woman would be human. So we have to ask, how can a, how can a human defeat a div divine being? Well, it, Im it implies that the seed of the woman will also be divine to be able to crush the head of a divine being. The very creatures that the serpent wanted to destroy will be his undoing. The promised blessing, Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Only the Messiah could literally bless all of the families of the earth. The promise 
of eternal. Genesis 17, 19, God speaking to Abraham. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for him, his offspring after him. The Messiah will have an everlasting bond to his people. The promise of an everlasting kingdom, 2 Samuel 7, 16, God's message to David, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The Messiah would be a king and a ruler forever. Now, at this point, we could, we could understand the disciples would probably have been in full agreement. This is exactly the type of Messiah they wanted. Hopefully, they would have been picking up on the fact that the Messiah would be both human and divine to be able to fulfill these. Next, Jesus may have started talking about the promise of sacrifice. Genesis 22, 6 through 8, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took his hand, and in his hand, he took the fire and the knife. So they went both together of, they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Abraham had Isaac carry the wood for the altar that he would be sacrificed on, just as Jesus carried his own cross. But before Abraham could sacrifice his own son, the knife was stopped. 2,000 years later, God the Father would take his own son, Jesus, up the same hill and provide him as a sacrifice. And this time, the knife would not be stopped. The promise of covering blood, Exodus 12, 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The sacrificial blood is necessary for God's judgment to pass over those covered by it. A perfect and pure sacrifice is needed. Also in Numbers, it states that the Messiah will be a perfect and pure sacrifice because no bones will be broken. The law stated that no bones were to be broken of the sacrificial lambs. And during the crucifixion, Jesus' legs were not broken, which was not typical. The criminals on each side of Jesus had their legs broken, so they would die faster. The promise of life, Numbers 21, 9. When the Israelites were in the wilderness and being attacked, by, attacked and killed by snakes, God told Moses to make an image of a serpent and raise it up on a pole. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. The bronze serpent lifted up, this, this image of death was lifted up and became a standard of life. Jesus was lifted up on the cross, and that instrument of death became a standard that brings life. This standard brings life. The promise of being cursed, Deuteronomy 12, 22 through 23, God's law states, and if a man has committed a crime perish, punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. A criminal that hangs on a tree is cursed by God. The Messiah couldn't possibly be cursed by God. He couldn't possibly die on a cross, a tree. But the Messiah did die on a tree and was cursed by God when he took on our sins, but only for a moment. The promise of suffering, Psalm 22, 14 through 18. I am poured out like water and my, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. 
It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encom encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. David, this is David. David can be read with typology. His lament can be read as Christ's lament. And this becomes a pretty accurate description of the suffering the Messiah endured. The promise of being despised, Isaiah 49, 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation. The disciples expected a Redeemer that would be loved and lauded by everyone. They were probably very excited about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem where he was praised, but confused when the people turned on him and despised him. The promise of his death for us, Isaiah 53, 2 through 5, for he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The Messiah's suffering and death was because of us and for us. The promise of silence, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. The disciples expected a Messiah of authority that would, could destroy an enemy like Pilate, like the Romans. Instead, Jesus was silent before Pilate. The promise of atonement, Isaiah 53, 10 and through 12, yet it was the will of God of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. Out of the anguish of his soul we shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and shall bear their iniquities. The disciples believed that the plan had failed. But it was God's plan all along for the Messiah to die, to die for our sin, to make us righteous. And the promise of the resurrection. Psalm 16, 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. The Messiah would not see decay. Other criminals when they were taken down off the cross, were thrown in the garbage pit. Instead, Jesus' body was requested by a secret disciple, a rich man, and Jesus was buried in an unused tomb, which is stated in Isaiah. Job talks about seeing his Redeemer in the flesh. Daniel writes of the Messiah having everlasting dominion. And even all the way to Zechariah 14.4, on the future day of the Lord's judgment, it says, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the, mountain, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east and west. All these make references to a Messiah that is living, which means the Messiah must be resurrected. This list probably just scratches the surface. But these may have been some of the passages that the disciples, these disciples, had trouble with. The Messiah's work was one of spirit. Now, perhaps a moment of, of self-reflection. What perceptions do you have of Jesus? Where do they come from? Do they come from your imagination? Because what happens when there's holes in our information? Our minds will just automatically fill them in. Nature abhors a vacuum, even an intellectual one. Do our perceptions come from the media that we take in? 
Movies and television shows do not have biblical agendas. They have entertainment agendas. They take artistic license and they have a goal of making money. Even fairly decent portrayals like The Passion of the Christ or even, even The Chosen. They're still not scripture. And assumptions are always made. Or are your perceptions formed by Scripture, the Bible, the Word written that reveals the Word living? Unfortunately, this may be the least used source for most people, and imagination perhaps the most used. The problem that the disciples had with their perception of the Messiah is that they did know Scripture, and some of it didn't fit their perceptions of what they thought reality would be or should be. So what were they doing? They were either ignoring some scripture or they were misinterpreting it. They were letting their imaginations take over, being driven by their own desires. They had an incorrect perception of the Messiah. Therefore, Jesus failed them. If we have an incorrect perception of the Messiah... Jesus will ultimately fail us too. And it won't be when we meet Jesus after our lives are over, it won't be, huh, I pictured you taller. It'll be worse than that. It will be, huh, you're not the God I expected. You're not the God I thought you were. There are statements made by the world that should make us as Christians cringe, such as, there are some parts of the Bible I like and some parts of the Bible I don't like. Well, the whole Bible points to Jesus. If you leave some of it out, you will have an incomplete understanding. Or the statement, the God I believe in would never do that, or not be that way, or would accept this or that. Based on what? What what are you basing that on? Your own imagination again? If it's in the Bible, it's something we must face and believe. If we choose to ignore or misinterpret Scripture when it comes to Jesus, we create a Jesus in our own image. Then when we pray, when we pray in Jesus' name, who, who who are we praying to? Ourselves? When we pray, Jesus, come into my heart, If we are praying to a Jesus of our own making, that prayer becomes an incantation. It becomes witchcraft. It's a spell so we can avoid going to the bad place and ensure that we go to the good place. But if that prayer is prayed as an image of the two disciples... Having starting out with your own selfish preconceived perceptions shattered so that your world has crumbled down with Jesus revealing himself to you from scripture and having your perceptions realigned to scripture, our heart burning within and creating desire to be with Jesus, inviting Jesus in, having that increased level of intimate relationship pictured by the sharing of a meal together. Having your eyes open to see, truly see who Jesus is, this is a picture of salvation, a picture of becoming a true follower of Christ. Let me leave you with this. In Acts 17, verse 11, Paul and Silas preaching to the Berean Jews Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Do you search the scriptures to have that correct perception of Jesus? Do you receive it with eagerness to have that burning heart desire for Jesus? Do you invite him in to fellowship? Do you invite him in to fellowship with him? And if you think you if you think you're found wanting when it comes to this, you're you're in light company. We all are. But just as Jesus went out 
and found these two disciples that were walking away and turned them and brought them back. Our prayer could be that Jesus comes and finds us and also turns us back. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, when left to our own devices, we will come up with, uh, we will invent everything that is not you. Thank you that in your mercy you have given us your completed word that reveals who you are. And not only that, but through the Holy Spirit you give us understanding of your word. That you are willing to say to us, come, let us reason together. May that cause our hearts to burn and never go cold again. In Jesus' name, amen.